2030. For green activists, it's a good step forward, but it's not enough. And two days ahead of key parliamentary elections in Tunisia, violence breaks out between security forces and suspected Islamist militants. They are currently holed up in a house and refuse to surrender. Hello and welcome to France 24. I'm Aurora Dupuis. We're broadcasting live from Paris. Let's go straight to our top story. A man has attacked authorities with an axe in New York City. The police officers were on patrol when a photographer asked them to pose for a picture. Well, one of them was suddenly hit in the arm while the other was struck in the head. The other officers opened fire on the assailant, who was pronounced dead at the scene. His identity hasn't yet been confirmed and his motive remains unclear. Well, the injured officers are currently in hospital. One of them is in a critical condition and a woman who was hit by a stray bullet is also being treated. We'll, of course, keep you updated as soon as the story develops right here on France 24. Well, staying in New York, for the first time since the Ebola outbreak, a doctor has been infected in the Big Apple. He recently returned from Guinea, where he was treating Ebola patients during a mission with Doctors Without Borders. He came down with a fever on Thursday and went straight to Bellevue uh, Hospital, where he's been isolated. Dr Spencer is the fourth person to be hit by the virus in the, the US, as Yuka Roya reports. The first confirmed case in the Big Apple. City officials were quick to try and allay fears of the deadly virus spreading through one of the most populous cities in the world. We want to state at the outset there is no reason for New Yorkers to be alarmed. We are as ready as one could be for this circumstance. Um, what happened in Dallas was actually the exact opposite. We had the advantage of learning from the Dallas experience. The patient, Dr Craig Spencer, treated Ebola cases in Guinea, working with the NGO Doctors Without Borders. After he returned to the city on October the 17th, he closely monitored his conditions and limited social activities, although he did leave his home while feeling well. We are aware that he went on a three-mile jog, a uh, sign that he was feeling quite well, uh, and he also uh, took the uh, subway system. Dr Spencer started showing symptoms of high fever and diarrhoea on Thursday morning. He was immediately transferred to New York's Bellevue Hospital, a designated Ebola centre, and placed in isolation. His fiancée and two friends, the only people he had come in close contact with since his return to the US, have also been quarantined. They're said to be in good health. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization is sending experts to Mali to help the country cope with its first Ebola case. A two-year-old girl has been put into quarantine along with her relatives. Her mother reportedly died in Guinea a few weeks ago and her family brought her to Mali to take care of her. Well, Ebola has killed more than 4,800 people in West Africa, mainly in Liberia, Guinea and Sierra Leone. The EU has just announced it would boost its aid to 1 billion euros, but for the US, and there needs to be more aid workers on the ground. Take a listen. Where we are still having uh, difficulty, of course, is getting enough health workers out in the field. Of all of the challenges and all of the difficulties, this still remains the most basic challenge and the, and the greatest difficulty. So whether it's getting people who are um, from the country itself or getting international health workers, uh, this is still the biggest challenge. Ultimately, it's about the planet's survival. Those are the words of Herman van Rompuy, the president of the European Council, chaired a key summit in Brussels, and he said that EU leaders have reached a landmark deal to tackle climate change. They've agreed to cut greenhouse emissions considerably and to boost the use of green energy instead. But for countries like Poland that rely heavily on coal, it could be difficult to reach that goal. Charlotte Hawkins explains. A landmark deal. By 2030, the EU will cut greenhouse gas emissions to at least 40 per cent below 1990 levels. A binding commitment which took the 28 leaders hours to agree upon. It was not easy, not at all, but we managed to reach a fair decision. It sets Europe on an ambitious yet cost-effective climate and energy path. As well as reducing emissions, 
Leaders agreed that by 2030, energy should become 27 percent more efficient, and renewable energy must provide at least 27 percent of the bloc's needs. Environmentalists have criticised the goals as not going far enough to combat global warming, but diplomats defended them as the only way to get all states on board. Heavily reliant on coal, Poland put up strong opposition to the targets, saying the pace of change was too fast for Eastern European countries as they tried to grow their economies. Poorer EU states will receive help in meeting the objectives. There is, if you like, a target zone between 0 and 40 percent, and it will be broken down according to GDP. Countries that have higher GDP will have to contribute more, and others that have less will have to contribute less. The agreement makes the EU the first major economy to set emissions targets for after 2020. Leaders hope it will encourage others to do the same ahead of a global climate pact to be adopted in Paris next year. Michael Ziad Bibo reportedly told a judge to send him to jail three years ago to prevent him from harming others. That's according to Canadian media. The man who killed a soldier and then stormed into the Ottawa parliament was gunned down on Wednesday and he had a criminal record. And authorities say he was undergoing a, quote, radicalization process. Well, during his trial in 2011, he reportedly told the judge that he was dealing with an addiction to crack cocaine and that he wanted to go to prison. Well, the investigation is still ongoing. Lorna Shaddock tells us more about Bebo's profile. Well, as Canadians come to terms with the attack that took place just behind me here in Ottawa at the War Memorial, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police have announced that the perpetrator of that attack did, in fact, apply for a passport, a passport that his mother has since told them he was intending to use to travel to Syria. Now, that passport application hadn't been rejected, but it was being investigated further, and it appears that that delay was potentially what helped motivate uh, Michael Zahaf Bibo into carrying out the uh, fatal attack just behind me. Now, that has sparked questions here in Canada. Canada about the power of the Canadian security services, given that uh, they've also admitted that Mr. Bibeau was not on their list of around 90 or so Canadians who were already being closely watched for uh, potential links to foreign terrorist organizations. Uh, they're now saying that, uh, many here are now saying that perhaps uh, the powers of the Canadian security services need to be beefed up a little bit to ensure that people like that don't fall through the net. Others, however, are saying that those powers were already significantly expanded back in 2012 when uh, the Canadian security services were given powers to do things like use secret courts to compel witnesses to give up evidence about potential foreign terrorist attacks. So can I, Canadians really concerned now about keeping that balance between security and civil liberties, although uh, one political writer here in the Canadian capital has already said that uh, Canada has lost its innocence. A policeman has been killed in Tunisia. Security forces clashed with suspected Islamist militants. Violence broke out on the outskirts of Tunis, where two militants are currently hiding in a house, keeping several women and children hostage. Well, since Thursday, police negotiators have tried to convince them to surrender following a heavy gun battle. Well, this is all the more worrying because on Sunday, Tunisia is planning to hold key parliamentary elections. Franz Van Katz, Chris Moore reports from Tunis. Well, this situation ongoing in Wed Alila, working class part of the Tunis suburb since Thursday morning. Security forces there say they've surrounded two what they say are suspected uh, Islamist militants holed up in a house with a number of women and children. They say they've been acting on information gleaned from two other terror suspects arrested uh, in the south of the country. Negotiations ongoing to end that siege. Security is a concern for Tunisians going into Sunday's parliamentary election. The country has avoided uh, much of the chaos seen in other Arab Spring, so-called nations, notably uh, neighbouring Libya. But one of the effects of the fall of the Ben Ali regime was the shackles coming off for Islamist radicals. There have been these uh, ongoing battles between security forces uh, and militants in Mount Shambi near the uh, Algerian border. Other pockets of concern around the country uh, for the authorities, most notably near the Libyan border, which is being shut for uh, three days as uh, the voting uh, goes on. Security not the only concern, of course, for Tunisian voters, many of them preoccupied by essentially uh, practical concerns as opposed to the uh, more ideological ones we saw uh, after 2011's revolution, notably uh, the economy, access to jobs, unemployment, which is higher now than it was uh, under Ben Ali. These are the things which are concerning Tunisian voters ahead of Sunday's poll. And that wraps up this edition. Thanks for watching. France 24, do stay tuned.